Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Coffee and Conversation, uh, our monthly get together with um, uh, that we host here through the SBDC, the Cal Poly Small Business Development Center. Uh, thank you for being with us this morning. And today I'm very excited to introduce you to Steve Eret and Simon Arkell. Um, Simon, we're doing things a little differently this morning. Uh, Simon is going to be our moderator and interviewer of Steve Eret. Um, Simon is a lot more, um, uh, I'm not trying to look for the right words. A lot more entertaining than I am. So this is going to be a very fun session. <laughs> um, oh, it's just the Australian accent that makes it sound so <laughs> That's what it is. It's just, that's what, he leverages that accent. Um, <laughs> Simon has introduced us to Steve, who has an amazing, amazing um, uh, entrepreneurial journey to share. Uh, it's, it's about navigating uh, uh, a new environment that's been you know, thrust upon us due to COVID. Um, it's a great story of pivot uh, and making the best of, uh, you know, definitely making lemonade out of lemons. Um, I won't say much more. I'm gonna leave you all hanging, but this is a, a fantastic entrepreneurial journey in a, 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 you know, that Steve has gone through over the last 12 months. Very inspiring, very motivating. So we'll hear more in just a few minutes. Um, just to do a quick intro, so the Small Business Development Center, uh, we're one of about a thousand in the U.S. We're here to provide um, coaching to business owners throughout San Luis Obispo County. Uh, anyone can actually connect with us and ask for services, but we, we market just to our local region. Uh, we're here to help you achieve your goals, whatever they might be for your business. Um, we're very, we have a lot of expertise around uh, accessing funding, capital funding, be it through bank lending, um, through SBA loans, or through equity funding. Um, we help with strategic business planning, and we work with companies from startup, uh, from startup all the way through to large scaling companies. We have some pretty large clients with 100 plus employees, uh, and we have a very uh, experienced team of consultants that can help uh, do some real strategic work. Uh, we have about 34 consultants on board that can work with you. So if you want to learn more, don't hesitate to connect with us. Uh, our website's at the bottom of the slide, sbdc.calpoly.edu. And you can just email us directly as well at slowsbdc at gmail.com. We're funded by the SBA. Uh, and by the California governor's office. Uh, we use that funding to pay our consultants to work with you. So all of our consultants are paid to, um, to meet with you, to, they're very accountable. Um, and that's what, how we use our, our funding. Uh, and I'd like to introduce real briefly our sponsor, uh, Maynard Cooper, a uh, corporate law firm, corporate securities law firm based in the Bay Area. Uh, and here's a, a quick note from our sponsor. Thank you. Oh. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamal al Haj, and I'm a partner with Maynard Cooper & Gale in the firm's San Francisco office. Maynard Cooper is a full-service law firm of national reach with over 300 lawyers across 11 offices coast to coast. Our San Francisco practice focuses on advising emerging growth companies and venture capital firms, including with respect to equity management, financings, employment, and intellectual property matters. We are extremely proud to be a Founder Circle sponsor amongst an extraordinary circle of other dedicated philanthropists who recognize the immense value that Cal Poly's Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship bring to the SLO community. We hope that each of you enjoys this upcoming training and workshop and are able to incorporate the knowledge and know-how that will be presented shortly to further help grow, develop, and accelerate your businesses. So thank you to our sponsor, Mary Cooper. Um, okay, um, let's see. So I'm going to let Simon, I'm gonna let you take it from here. I'm gonna let you do a quick intro. Please give us a little intro about your background. Uh, so Simon is a Cal Poly alum. Um, so a few, few, you know, a few words about that, Simon, please. And then I'll let you introduce Steve and take it from here. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, Judy. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, great. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Simon Arkell. And um, as Judy mentioned, I'm a Cal Poly alum. I um, got my MBA from Cal Poly, graduated in 1994, many moons ago. 
and um, always have just been in love with the whole San Luis Obispo area. I'm originally from Australia, but came to the US as a as an athlete and moved to San Luis Obispo to train in my sport, but uh, got my MBA at the same time. Um, I have since moved away, but um, always find myself coming back to the San Luis Obispo area and just love it up there and even have a, a home up there now. Um, I'm also on the Dean's Advisory Committee for the Orfala Business School. I'm on the President's Council of Ad Advisors for President Armstrong, and I'm an advisor to the CIE um, and Hot House. And um, my day job is as founder and uh, president of, co-founder and president of Deep Lens, which is an artificial intelligence software company. And we focus in the oncology space, matching uh, cancer patients to available clinical trials. So we work with uh, cancer centers and sponsors, which are the big you know, biotechs and pharma companies. I was um, uh, talking to my friend, Steve here, who I'm gonna introduce right now. And something popped up as really one of the most um, interesting and amazing stories I've heard in a long time. And it specifically relates to the art of the pivot. And I've done about 10 startups now in my career and pivots, are, and I think uh, many entrepreneurs here can probably um, you know, uh, you know, get behind this and associate with this. And that is that the need to pivot sometimes is either subtle or it can be in your face. And we're gonna talk about one that's very much in your face today. I met Steve actually, because uh, we're here in Orange County where we live and uh, our sons both mountain bike together. And Steve's son, Daniel is a, is a great mountain biker and pretty wicked on a snowboard as well. Bit of a daredevil I might add. Um, he probably gets that from his dad who um, has a bit of uh, startup adrenaline going probably on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was um, really intrigued because Steve um, has for many years, been a managing partner with a firm called Sandbox Marketing, which he started 20 years ago with his partner. And you know, after many, many years doing corporate marketing, event marketing, et cetera, which Steve is gonna explain here, I was really, really intrigued to hear about an event that happened, which we can all probably uh, um, uh, remember, and that is uh, when COVID hit. And so last year, Steve was faced with a basically night and day decision to completely renovate his company and his business model. And so I'm gonna stop there for a second and Steve, you know, please introduce yourself, give some background. I know you're gonna show a few slides and I'm gonna very rudely jump in with questions here and there, but um, we're gonna be talking today about the art of the pivot. And I will just tell you that I'm going from what was a quite successful small business in event marketing to an absolute blowout success that took advantage of the global pandemic, um, but helped people along the way. So he's, he and his partner have um, very much benefited from what's happened over the last year, um, but it's actually been, I think, really instrumental for their customers. And so I'll hand it over to you, Steve. And so please introduce yourself and I'll be jumping in here and there. And also, sorry, I'm just going to jump in real quick. Sorry, Steve. If anyone has questions, please um, put your questions in the Q&A and I'll, I'll monitor the questions in the Q&A. So we like to encourage the, uh, our audience to ask questions as well and I'll, I'll feed those through. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you for the kind introduction, Simon. I appreciate that and it's uh, nice to um, have everyone joining us this morning. My connection with, um, with Cal Poly Slow is that I have a nephew who graduated there um, as alumni, um, I think from probably three or four years ago as a materials engineer. Um, and he now lives up in the Portland area with his family. So there's uh, my, my connection to the, to the Mustang family. Um, yeah, so we all have quite an interesting story from 2020. You know, each and every one of us has been affected by this pandemic from one way you know, to another, small business owners, to just you know, citizens alike, uh, we've all been affected by the the various lockdowns, business slowdowns. Um, you know, we we all have a story, and that story continues into 2021. You know, we're still facing um, hospitals that are overloaded. We still have kids that are challenged with distant learning. We still have businesses that are struggling, and of course, we've got a lot of political turmoil in this country. So we're at a real crossroads right now. But you know. At Sandbox Marketing, we were able to really take advantage of um, what has been a, a real sour note for so many people 
but we were able to use it as an opportunity to resurrect a business that was essentially dying on the vine. And we were faced with a choice to either go file for unemployment like so many other millions of people have, or to use that entrepreneurial spirit that I'm hoping that each of you out there in the audience has as a small business owner, or even just an individual with that entrepreneurial, you know, great American can-do spirit um, to, to really, as we have used already the term, to really pivot and to take on a new challenge and to, to really um, take advantage of the opportunities that exist in this country. So I'm going to um, share my screen. Here we are. So pivoting during a pandemic. The first 20 years of Sandbox Marketing um, were filled with um, producing national tours, doing live event production for various corporate clients, um, producing trade show exhibits for quite a number of, of clients, doing international sales conferences and, and sales meetings, um, hosting you know, yacht uh, dinner parties, doing just you know, quite a number of different types of event marketing and live event production. So, you know, we have a little bit of experience over the past 20 years in pivoting as we sort of had to reinvent our business almost on a yearly or maybe every five-year basis as corporate clients would come and go. You know, so many large advertising agencies might have, you know, a five or 10-year contract with Coca-Cola or Home Depot to produce their advertising campaigns. But that doesn't really work in the event marketing business. And it's really on a project by project or task basis. So, you know, we would be hired to produce a uh, six month tour for a, a particular client, but it was never really a multi-year opportunity. So we would have to prove ourselves every single year to that client or to a series of sponsors on, you know, why they should join our particular program. And I'll get into some of the events that we produced over the years. But you know, this, this major pivot that we did in March was, was really precipitated by little mini pivots over the past 20 years, just in order to keep the business thriving as you know, uh, people's event marketing plans shift over the years. After a series of years, they want to go in a bit of a different direction. Maybe funding has gone in a different direction. So we had to produce a lot of little mini pivots along the way. Yeah, I was and going to ask that, Steve. Sorry to interrupt, but um, it's interesting because my you know, my industry is uh, about subscription-based software. And if you um, close a client and they're quite happy with the service, they just basically auto-renew. And so your a annual recurring revenue goes up and you can pretty much count, you know, less the churn. You can pretty much count on that business on an right. ongoing basis. But if you're all project-based businesses, do you feel like, that over the 20 years created uh, kind of the DNA to always be looking over your shoulder and you know wondering, you know, okay, what are we gonna have to do in order to make sure that we win that business again, even though you've gotten it? Yeah, it, it really did. Um, you know, here we are 20 years down the road and oftentimes we felt like a startup every single year because we had to prove ourselves time and time again as we engaged with a new client as to why they should hire us for their sales meeting or for their national tour to promote their particular product. Um, so every single year we would have to act as that, that new startup and to be really hungry and to not really rest on, on our laurels thinking, oh, okay, we've got a five-year contract. Boy, we're just gonna kind of sit back and, and take it easy. That, that hasn't been the case for us over the years. So it really kind of kept us primed and you know, ready for every single challenge, whether it be over the last 20 years or certainly you know, over this particular pandemic over the, uh, in 2020. So I'll mention briefly here, um, one of the last uh, things you see here is the signs and graphics. We started a sign um, printing business about four years ago to supplement the event marketing side of the world because um, it provided a secondary revenue stream to sort of offset some of the um, ups and downs of the event marketing business, as I alluded to earlier. And that has a, a fairly significant role in, um, in how we were able to pivot. 
So, you know, I, um, I think also the, the term that comes to mind is luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And um, you know, obviously what you're going to get to here after you show um, a few examples of the work you did with the event marketing business is great. Absolutely. But, you know, what, what, what created the sign and graphic business? Was there some event that had you think, hey, we should start building signs for our customers? Was there one thing? And if so, was that just pure luck, which actually put you in that position? to uh, do the, the great pivot? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me go into this next slide here, which um, highlights one of the event marketing um, tours that we did. And this is uh, for a company called Journeys. They're a footwear retailer that you may have seen <clears throat> in malls across the country. They've got about 300 stores across the country. They're a part of the uh, same corporate company that owns Lids and Hat World and She and Johnston and Murphy. They're a very large, uh, uh, clothing and, and footwear retailer based in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So we produced a sports and music festival for them um, for seven years in 42 cities uh, across the country. And we would pack 25,000 people into a parking lot um, in, in Nashville or in Long Island or Orlando, Florida. Um, and we had everything from freestyle motocross, as you can see on the uh, lower left-hand side there, to skateboarding events. I mean, we had Sean White, we had the likes of Tony Hawk, we had Bam Margera from the, the show Jackass back in the day. So we had some really major sporting talent that performed these live demonstrations at the events, um, along with some fairly big named bands, um, you know, from back in the day. And so you can see a little bit of the signage opportunities um, that we would, we would put in place to promote the sponsors. Over here on the, on the bottom right-hand side, on the, on the vert ramp there, you see a Vans banner, you see Rockstar Energy Drink, and then you see something similar over uh, on the freestyle motocross ramp to where we would produce that signage for each of the particular tours. Um, and we would always use an outside vendor um, and, you know, sometimes it was a little touch and go in terms of the timing when the trucks needed to get on the road. So we were always very dependent on, on vendors. And over the years, and this gets back to your question about um, the, the sign side of the business is every event that we've ever produced, we needed to produce signage to promote the sponsors or the advertiser or even simple little directional signage that would... Um, you know, allow the attendees to know which way they needed to go to get to the particular conference room at the hotel. So there's always a need for signage. And that's when we decided just four years ago to, to buy a printer and to bring some people on board and essentially create Sandbox Sign Company as a, as a subsidiary of Sandbox Marketing to produce signage for our events. But then also it sort of stands on its own um, to, to do, you know, vehicle graphics and lobby signs for businesses, you know, LED channel letters for um, a liquor store, that sort of thing. So it sort of stands alone on, um, as a separate business entity. So I'll, I'll move on to a couple of the other sort of events that we've done. This is a, um, a company called Cremo. They're a men's grooming brand and they make everything from um, you know, pomade and hair gel to beard balm and beard serum. And this is a 1947 uh, Airstream trailer that we customized and toured the country for three years going to major music festivals across the country to offer men um, haircuts and beard trims. And it was really just a, uh, a platform in order to sample the Cremo product and to help drive sales into the drug and food chain, the grocery store chain where these uh, products are sold. So this is a very fancy way of, of essentially doing product sampling. Um, and that, that was going very strong again until you know, that fateful day in March. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other things that we've done over the years our trade show displays. This is a, uh, a one that we produced for Bose for an in-ear noise canceling headphone that actually acts as a hearing aid device because it's got um, microphones in the earbuds that, um, that project the sound and you can actually noise cancel sound around 
you cancel it out so you could focus on the person who's in front of you, um, you know, having a conversation. So everything from live events to trade show events um, to corporate sales meetings for this company uh, based here in Southern California called Henkel Adhesives. And they make all of the adhesive that Apple uses on their iPhones and that Ford uses on their backup cameras on, on, um, on automobiles. And so this was a sales meeting that we produced for them. So, so just to, to jump in here, um, obviously looking at all of these different clients and different projects you did, whether it was, you know, motocross in a, in a mall to an adhesive company sales meeting, like so diverse. Um, it feels to me like you were perfectly set up to be super creative in what we're about to talk about. And obviously that signage uh, piece and the luck is where preparation meets opportunity, which I talked about earlier. So I want to actually get to that point. Like what, what really intrigued me about your story was how you'd booked um, at early last year enough deals to where it was going to, it looked like it was going to be a really nice year. So step us through that moment where you realized that you were screwed. <laughs> well, it was on this fateful day on March 15th. Um, <laughs> You know, that's a that's sort of a day that will go down in infamy, such as, uh, you know, December 7th, 1941 and, and various other days <laughs> where this is the day that we got several calls from clients um, indicating and, and particularly the Cremo client indicating that that they were not going to be able to continue uh, with the tour. And of course, news was swirling. We all remember the headlines about, you know, this virus that was um you know, just, just coming on board here. And the tipping point for the news that we received from Cremo and others was the news that South by Southwest, which is, I'm sure many of you know, is a, a music industry event that happens in Austin, Texas every year. And that event, along with the Coachella Music Festival here in Southern California, are really the two sort of gold standard events that happen in this country. There are many other large events. There's the Super Bowl and, you know, massive music festivals, but from sort of an event marketing standpoint, it's Coachella and South by that really sort of dictate kind of what's going on in the industry. They're like the bellwethers of the industry. Yeah. And, and when South by announced that due to the outbreak that they were not going to conduct their two week long event there throughout the entire city of Austin, all of the dominoes started to fall because all of the other large music festivals from Summerfest in Wisconsin to Carolina Country in, in um, Myrtle Beach, they were all waiting to see what um, South By was going to do because then shortly thereafter, Coachella announced their cancellation as well. Um, but when those two companies uh, or, or events decided to cancel, then everything else fell apart from there. So that March 15th was really the, the end of the world as we know it from a marketing, uh, event marketing standpoint. Yep. So, so um, I know we only have about half an hour left. I, I know that people are going to be really interested with the, the meat of this. So just to fast forward to that point. So I'm assuming all of your customers canceled their contracts that you were basically going to be relying on for your main business for the whole year. And yeah. then, and then an idea came up. So can you describe like how that idea came about? Was it that luck? Was it something that you proactively went out and made happen? And then what turned that into what was your pivot? Yeah. Well, so we have a, um, Brian and I have a mutual friend that uh, is an administrator at a school district here in Orange County, and they were starting to evaluate um, sneeze guards to go on to the desks for students um, to help with all of the other protocols from mask wearing to um, disinfecting and social distancing, um, but they weren't happy with what they were seeing out there on the market. Um, sorry, I'm going to pass through here. As we all know, there have been no concerts or music festivals and all that. So now what? So they were starting to evaluate some of these desk shields that you see here. The one here on the left is very flimsy. The one that the young lady is sitting in front of is made from a, you know, a plastic yard sign or a political sign type of uh, material. 
that has a clear um, insert. Some of them are even more restrictive in, in front of their viewing. Um, some of these that you see on the right-hand side are made of acrylic, which is a very expensive material, and it's not very portable. It's, it's fixed in place with you know, fused 90-degree angles. And so the, the cabinet at the school district was really not happy with what they were seeing out there on the market. And so our, our compatriot, Brad, said, hey, guys, I know that you guys are, are marketing geeks. You guys have been in this business for a long time. You're creative. He goes, why don't you come up with something better? I, I, see what you guys can come up with. So that was our challenge. We didn't have anything going on in the marketing world anymore. We lost over a million dollars in book business. And we thought, well, what else are we going to do? At the time, we were making some social distancing uh, you know, decals to go onto the ground for some banks and a local CVS drugstore. But that wasn't going to keep the business afloat. Um, so we started to do some research on different types of materials. And, and we might all be familiar with you know, acrylic or plexiglass. Um, there's a material called PET which is the most widely used plastic in, uh, on earth right now, um, unfortunately, in all of the landfills and, and back bays, it's, it's everywhere. But think of a, of a plastic water bottle that you might be drinking out of right now. That's what PET is, uh, that, that's what that water bottle is made out of. And then there's also Lexan, which is a type of polycarbonate, but it's very expensive and, and not terribly practical. Um, so we started to do some research on what kind of materials were out there in the world and how we could source these materials um, and where we could get them manufactured. And so that was sort of the, the impetus of, of what became the desk guard. Um, and and, and Steve, so just to put the human side of this back into the picture here, because this is fascinating, but I'm really interested in what was going through your mind at the time. So you have this business for 20 years with a partner I'm guessing it's not tens of millions of dollars a year. It's probably in the low millions in revenue anyway. And basically oh, yeah. the entire rug got pulled out from under you. How are you feeling oh, about this while you're researching plastic thinking, holy shit, I'm going to lose my house or my wife's going to kill me or like, are we going to have to rent an apartment? Like what's going through your mind personally yeah. while you're also, are you panicking while you're looking for plastic or like what's, what are you doing here? Oh, it was, it was absolute devastation. Um, you know, in, in the best years of Sandbox over the past 19, you know, our, our biggest revenue uh, in a single year was about 3.2 million. You know, it, 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 we weren't turning into millionaires, but it was certainly allowing us to have nice homes and provide for our families and, um, you know, have a, a, a decent living and to employ um, eight or nine people. We're, we're, we're a micro company for sure. But knowing that the event marketing world was coming to an end, and um, the sign, even the sign business was, was dwindling down to basically zero because people weren't getting signs made. And so even though we were foraying into this idea of making some sort of a, a desk shield, it was a huge gamble because we had no idea where this was going to go, if it would be successful. Um, but but the, the inkling of hope in this is that the... Um, school district that I mentioned um, was really our, our founding partner in on this. And you see this design in front of you, and I'll go into that briefly here, but once we presented this idea to them on this design, they were the first school district to come on board and they agreed to buy 25,000 units right off of the bat. So our very first order was really enough, had enough teeth in it that allowed us to purchase 100,000 units from, that was our first order from the factory in China. And let me tell you, that was a sort of a, um, a momentous day in that I was, you know, going into the bank to do a $212,000 um, wire transfer to China on a gamble. I mean, you talk about rolling the dice, that was, mm -hmm. that was kind of a, a sweaty palm day for sure. <laughs> Can I highlight awesome. Steve real quick? Um, you know, I, this is something that we harp on a lot through our various programs. We talk about having the presence of mind to um, to be really in tune to to, to customer development. Really, uh, here was some, you, there was a, re a request being made, 
And it's the, that capacity to filter, right? So customers ask for all sorts of things and you can go down rabbit holes, developing features, de developing new products that might be a total disaster. But there's something there where you responded to customer demand uh, and you were able to, to understand that there's an opportunity there. Um, I mean, I think to me, that's just so hugely important, right? Uh, that customer oh, development never yeah. ends. It's always, you have to always be present with that. that. That's right. And no matter what the business is, even if you are an inspirational speaker, you have to know who your audience is and what they demand. So whether it's a school district looking for a product or you know, you're a bakery uh, owner, you, you have to know what your customer truly wants and to meet their demand. Um, you know, so many businesses have, or, or, or entrepreneurs have an idea of what they think their business should be. And if you're not willing to be flexible and to meet the demands of the customer and just stick by your, your own preconceived notions, you have a, a, a really good chance of you know, maybe not succeeding or even failing, but certainly not succeeding to the best of your ability um, because of that, that inflexibility. So, you know, uh, you know, everyone should have a marketing plan and to do your SWOT analysis and to have a plan to go forward, but there has to be some flexibility because the road to success is not always a st straight uh, when, road, it's definitely a winding path. I, I always think about um, entrepreneurship as, you know, not stupid blind risk taking, but managed risk. But there are times where you have to roll the dice, you have to go out of the comfort zone beyond managed risk. For you to place a $212,000 order after your first order here, um, hoping uh, without a lot of data points that there is going to be a large market for this was a big stretch but if you'd gone if you would played smaller you may not have done nearly as well and and so you know there are times where i think just intuition and the dna that you created that sales iq that you created over the previous 20 years because you didn't have recurring revenue um you got lucky to be in the sign business, but that was smart and lucky um, because you needed it. And that was a market uh, need you were filling at the time. But all of those things transpired in some sort of Venn diagram to position you perfectly, but you wouldn't have done it had you not had the cojones to, to place that initial order at such a scale. And so yeah. Steve, Steve, can you like maybe respond to that? But I wanna fast forward to what happened next because this isn't just, oh yeah, and we sold another 20, you fricking went ballistic on this thing for many, many months. Well, yes, and um, it has been one heck of a roller coaster. And you, you talked about, um, you know, kind of having the courage to do this sort of thing. And, you know, as we approached um, you know, June and July, things were still as bleak as they are today on the event marketing side of things. And we didn't really have a choice. Um, I guess we could have had a choice and that would have been to go and file unemployment, lay off all of our employees, um, you know, terminate our lease, but that's not who we are as entrepreneurs. Um, that has never been in our DNA and we just decided to take a chance on it and, and move forward. So we, we started a, a pretty small scale, but aggressive marketing campaign and anyway, here's, here's the product. Here's what we created. Here is the desk guard itself. Um, and I'll get into it in, in just one moment. Um, I've frozen. To... Can, any, can everyone see? Okay, it just took a while. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, okay. So we initiated the outreach process. And the first thing that we did is that we purchased a database of 15,000 um, administrators and purchasing um officials from school districts across the country. And we blasted it out via MailChimp. Um, and at the same time, we, were, we initiated some tw uh, twice daily Zoom webinars where my business partner, Brian, was conducting uh, Zoom webinars out of a video studio that we created uh, at our office. And as he's conducting these Zoom uh, webinars, highlighting the desk guard and, and the product features and benefits, I was monitoring my email and, 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 and the questions that were coming in. 
and I was getting orders and requests for estimates for 500 units, for 5,000 units, sort of live as these Zoom webinars were going on. And it was just incredible how this ramped up from this um, initial request of 25,000 units from our local school district to schools in, in Florida and New Hampshire and Washington and every, country, every state in between requesting product because what we had was, was a well-built product. It was very simple. It was priced competitively compared to what was out there on the market for two, three, four times as much. Um, and we had a real winning design as you go back and, and you see it here. Um, you know, it, it looks very simple, but it's a trifold design. It's got elbow cutouts that you can see sort of near the chair there. So it allows a student to put their elbows on a desk while it still protects um, the, the side as you may turn to cough or something like that. And then you see the, the handles, the holes at the top of the material there, as the three sides fold together, it creates a common carry handle so that the students can carry the desk guard from classroom to classroom and essentially take their germs with them um, and, and uh, allow the schools to come in and do some disinfecting on the desktop surfaces in between classrooms or in between classes. So can I jump in, Steve, real quick? Uh, we do have a question in the Q&A um, from Doug Shaw. He's stating, uh, if you could use one avenue only for marketing uh, for the next three years, what would it be? So I'm wondering, uh, you, you guys selected a specific path to marketing here. Um, anything you want to add in answer to that question? And it's, it's yeah. pretty- And if you're referring to specifically marketing on the desk guard, um, our biggest success with this whole thing has been the onboarding um, with the distributors that you see listed here. We were very um, tactical and yet ran into some luck by, by getting um, Office Depot and a company called BSN Sports as well as Southwest School and Office Supply to onboard us as vendors. So, you know, we had a, a small uh, direct sales force of about five people that were helping to, to sell these desk cards. But Five people is not a massive Salesforce organization, but being a vendor with Office Depot allowed our desk guard to be sold and marketed by over 200 Office Depot sales reps across the country. And that has proved to be massively successful because again, we're just a micro company. It's Brian and myself, and we've got nine employees. And granted they're, they're in the sign business. We've got a sales rep, they're producing signage. So, you know, we're not this massive sales organization with a hundred sales reps. So having these distributors on board was really the biggest boon to our success. Case in point, um, some of the orders that we'll do for Office Depot might be for 500 units. They might be even for 10,000 units, but Southwest School and Office Supply, they're a large distributor of school and office supplies here in California to the K through 12 public school sector. Well, they order by the container load from us. So every time they place an order, it's for 8,000 units or 16 or 24 or even 56,000 units on one particular purchase order. And it, that's absolutely massive. You know, we got a PO um, about a month ago for $1.3 million. It was, it's mind boggling. Um, and so having those distributors on board to, to leverage their workforce uh, has been the biggest um, boon to our success. For so, you're, sure. so you're at the point now where this starts to rock and roll. Your uh, partner is doing the video demos um, on a just a regular cadence and inviting people. You're getting orders in in real time and fielding those. So now you're going from a services company for 20 years that's now basically fulfilling purchase orders, wondering and worrying about supply chain and doing stuff that were completely unnatural acts for you, I'm sure in the early oh, yeah. stages. What did it look like um, to drink from the fire hose and figure that out so that you didn't fall on your face? It, it was really rough. Um, the months of August, September and October 
were the three most challenging months of my entire life. Um, you know, we were learning an all new business. We, as you mentioned, we went from a, an event production company putting up sound and you know lights and video to figuring out how much shrink wrap needs to go on a pallet to secure you know, 600 uh, desk guards that weigh 2,600 pounds and you know, to, to do the proper banding to make sure the pallet doesn't fall apart and sending out 20 <laughs> and 30 orders a day and having containers coming in from the port that we were offloading and then transitioning those to be a shipment out to a customer. And so then you've got UPS Freight and XPO and various logistics companies um, you know, showing up at our back door to, to load out. And those 12 and 14 hour days were extremely mind bending in terms of the, the focus and attention that were required. It, um, and then getting paid, like how do you um, make sure you don't go bankrupt because you didn't get, you know, focus on getting paid at the right time? Is it COD? Yeah. Are you giving people terms? How do you pay your factory and make sure you don't run out of cash along the way? Yeah. One of the real benefits of working for um, and selling to school districts is that every single order is backed by a purchase order. Um, you know, from the, from the school district and, and sometimes the county, the board of education. And so e each of those orders that we were sending out, whether it be for 7,000 or 70,000 was, was really, you know, good as gold. And that is very comforting right. knowing that, you know, it's not a company that can just go out of business after they receive your order and, and they would stiff you. But knowing that, yeah. that it's backed by a board of education was, was yeah. really comforting um, but, you know, we still had to come up with the funding to pay the factory for the orders. Uh, yeah. you know, we, we have expended over $10 million in factory orders and customs and freight and duties, um, over the past six months. And that's a significant amount of money. So there were days where we were juggling, you know, uh, revenue that came in, of course, Brian and I had to pull money out of out of retirement and out of savings um, in order to fund some of these initial factory orders and to have that float for about 60 days before some of our first sales orders were paid. So it was very, um, it was fraught oh. with uncertainty and a lot of you sleepless, sleepless nights. nights. Yeah, I was going to say. All right, so let's let's get to the scale of this thing. Um, maybe I don't want to maybe go to the end first, but I, I think um, people will benefit from seeing what you've done if you're willing to you know share the details. Oh. But um, even general generalities, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. We're an we're an open book here. It, it's incredible. Um, but since we first started marketing this on July first we have sold nearly 1.4 million desk guards. And from that first order of 100,000, we thought, oh, okay, well, great. Um, we're gonna order another 100,000. And then it became two and three and four and 500,000. And I think, how long can this continue to go? Well, it's still going. Um, we, we feel like we're sort of reaching maybe the end of it. Um, sales have, have tailed off. Um, I think a lot of school districts are waiting for the second round of stimulus dollars to come in. Um, it's called the HEROES Act. So we're waiting to, to see how that funding is going to go. Um, I think people are very hopeful about the vaccine and, and having that um, help out. But a lot of schools have, have just decided flat out that they are going to continue with distant learning and they're not bringing students back maybe until February or until March. Yeah. So you'll probably see a second wave. Yeah. Slow down. So, so just, I just want to put this in context. So you had um, the best year you ever had for an entire year was three and a half million dollars, $3.2 million over the last 20 years. You pivot and do what we've just talked about. And since July one, and we're only in the second week of January right now of 21, you've done $30 million in revenue. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very surreal number to, to look at. Um, and this, there's my, this is why I wanted you to come onto this show because I yeah. think every entrepreneur on the planet needs to learn how to, well, hear stories of pivots and heroism in entrepreneurship, but 
this was not low, a low margin business either. I mean, you guys have done extremely well. And to me, it seems like there's another wave coming. Yeah, you know, we, we it, it is quite, and I'm at a loss for words because, you know, $29 million represents over, you know, or nearly 10 years of event marketing business um, in with months. a much greater profit margin um, at, at this point. You know, each desk guard uh, sells for about $25. It's lower for our distributors, um, but our landed cost here in the U.S. is about uh, $8. So there's a significant amount of profit margin there. Um, so this has been uh, a, a life-changing last six months um, in, in many ways. And so yeah. it, it, is, um, <laughs> it's, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity that we, that we seized. And, well, you've, uh, made, you've made $17 profit on 1.4 million units almost. That's yeah. just phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. And, you know, we're, we're, we're still, we're still going, you know, we've got another 200,000 units in our warehouse that we're, that we're selling, um, you know, each and every day we send two or three orders out. So this is, this is still, still going on, although we've reached the pinnacle um, in, yeah. in my mind, you know, in September and October, that was the big push uh, last year to get kids back in school. Um, yeah. you know, and some people have pulled the ripcord and, and various things like that, but it's, it's a heck of a story and I'm, I'm very, very proud to, to share it. So if you, if you've done 10 years of revenue in the last six months, um, and let's say this ended tomorrow, do you ever go back to event marketing? I mean, or do you say, look, we've just made so much money, you know, I, Steve, you're really old. And so like, would you even bother going back at this point? I'm kidding. Cause you're younger than me, but um, <laughs> would, would you, would you go back at this point or do you just do something completely different? Um, you know, I'm really torn with that. Um, we, we really like the event marketing business, you know, the engagement with, with consumers and with customers and the challenges of, of producing live events, whether it be on a yacht or in the middle of a parking lot um, has always been, uh, you know, intriguing over the years and very invigorating. Um, but in a little bit more of the twilight of my career, we're faced with many challenges on the event marketing side of things. One, as of right now, there are no events. And um, even seven to 10 years ago, the advent of social media and especially Facebook, Instagram, you know, the various different platforms has really started to erode the event marketing business to where, you know, if you're Wrigley's gum or if you're Cremo uh, men's grooming products, people have really started to question whether or not they need to go through the expense of hand-to-hand -hand sampling uh, campaigns or event marketing when they can just hire a team to do digital marketing and get their brand messaging out that way with right. either likes or thumbs up or, or you know, social interaction that way. And so you know, e even before COVID and this pivot away from event marketing, we were already starting to see some market erosion in our line of business with social media. And one of my fears is that event marketing may never fully recover because the last nine, 10 months or so, you've really started to see new event marketers come into play with, you know, uh, virtual concerts and virtual events and tying yeah. in the social media interaction. So, yeah. you know, we're a couple of old dinosaurs in the event marketing business, and I'm not so sure it's ever going to come back around to what we once knew. Well, I, uh, I just, so I, mean, I just pulled out a, about it. Yeah, I just pulled out a calculator and, you know, at high level, it, it looks like you and your partner who are, I'm assuming 50-50 partners each have made $23 million profit in the last six months. And to me, that means I'm sure there's taxes, you know, in that, but, um, you know, you get to do what you want to do, not what you have to do. And so what does that look like going forward? So you can maybe take your experience, help other people, do some new kind of innovative stuff without needing to pull a salary, that sort of thing. You yeah, about that? Mm. We, we would like to continue um, the marketing business and, and do con some consulting for events and or brands. 
um, and doing what we want to do, not necessarily what we have to do, as yeah. you alluded to. Um, and give give some money fun. to me and Judy. That would be a good <laughs> idea. Yeah, I was, I was you, know, suggest, you know, we have some great startups looking for investors. Um, yeah, don't worry, yeah. Judy. I've already started warming them up. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Simon. I knew I could count on you, Simon. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I'm definitely looking at some of those uh, some of those opportunities. Um, you know, maybe getting into the real estate side of things and doing some, you know, investing um, because you can do that from anywhere in the world, and uh, you don't necessarily need to be strapped to your desk uh, eight to five each day. So I'm looking forward to to those opportunities because I feel like I've um, missed out on on some of my children's um, highlights of their lives because I was always the guy that was at work all day, every day. So I'm looking forward to an opportunity of pulling it out of sixth gear a little bit and, uh, and kind of coasting and enjoying life just a little bit and um, mm. kind of managing the new phase of the business from either home or the road and, and not necessarily uh, at my, my office per se. Steve, quick, yeah. quick question, uh, back to more of a business question. Um, so in order to hit the 29.5 million revenue, someone was asking how much have you actually spent on marketing? Uh, it sounds like the marketing outreach was pretty minimal through these uh, Zoom webinars, but do, do you have a number for that? Well, that's, that's the marketing? interesting thing is that um, from a pure marketing standpoint, we spent $750 for this database of 15,000 administrators across the country. Um, that's the really only marketing that we've done short of building out a website, um, you know, producing some videos, sending out samples of desk guard units uh, to you know, hundreds of, of different school districts across the country for evaluation. So you could wrap up some of those dollars into marketing, um, but from a pure marketing standpoint, we did not take out Google AdWords. Um, we did not do any Instagram ads. This thing gathered so much momentum from the outset that we didn't need to. Um, that's been the most remarkable thing about this. It's almost like we've invented the next um, pet rock or the next hula hoop to where, not that it was a fad per se, but we invented something that 1.38 million people um, decided that they needed to have. And the momentum just snowballed. And so we didn't need to conduct any massive advertising campaigns. So that's been another fortunate aspect to this. Yeah, another, another question in there, Steve, was whether anyone's approached you to acquire the company. Um, I guess my, my immediate gut reaction to that is that you know, maybe this was, as you just mentioned, uh, a one-time thing, but maybe not. So have you had those conversations? Um, we have not been approached. And that has been a little bit of a surprise to me that, that someone hasn't come along, whether it be Office Depot or uh, right. Southwest or Amazon, seems like they buy everybody. Um, it's been a little bit of a surprise that we haven't been approached. Um, you know, I would certainly be willing to to entertain um, any sort of conversation like that, but we've just been keeping our head down and selling these things, and uh, we haven't had those conversations just yet. But I will interject this: that we have had some challenges along the way, in that we have had um, some counterfeiters, at least three, that have absolutely stolen our design, have marketed and we actually compete against some of these counterfeit artists uh, to, to our very same clients. And that has been one of the more frustrating aspects of this entire thing is that even though we're patent pending and at some point, uh, you know, and I never thought this would be the case, but I'll be listed as an inventor at the US Patent Office, we're only patent pending at this point and not patented. So we can't sue anybody for patent infringement. But um, back in August, there was a particular day that we lost $1.5 million in sales due to school districts pulling their POs from us and going with this, uh, this competitive uh, company. So that was a bitter pill to swallow, although okay. we got the better of them in the end. And I can uh, 
I can share that briefly if, uh, if we have time that allows. Yeah, we have about three minutes left. Judy, did you um, have anything else? No, 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 go for it. Uh, we'll, we'll do a quick 30 second wrap, but uh, I'd love to hear how that went down. <laughs> okay. Well, so this was in the state of New York and there was a local company in Long Island that received one of our samples that we had sent to a school district and they looked at it and went, oh, well, this is the easiest thing in the world. Let me, um, let's just redesign this. So they, they retraced it. They got their, you know, router machine, their flatbed router machine out and they started making desk guard ripoffs. Um, but the problem was compounded in that there is a, um, an obsolete statute in the New York State Building Code that says the material must uh, reach a certain um, flame threshold. Mm -hmm. Well, PET doesn't uh, abide by that. It, it burns at 550 degrees, whereas they stipulated that it has to be 800 degrees. So we quickly reformatted um, our formula to a derivative of PET called PETG that's got the 800 uh, degree flash point. Mm -hmm. We brought in 100,000 units specifically for the New York uh, state market. And instead of selling them for $25 a unit, we sold them for $45 a unit because the formula was more expensive. So even though we lost $1.5 million in sales, we were able to go back to the schools, tell them about this new formula that the, the, the competition, the, the counterfeiters couldn't uh, comply with. And we actually sold $2.3 million in desk guards. So we ended wow. up making $800,000 in additional revenue based upon this formulaic switch. So the, the bitter awesome. pill or the sour lemons turned into even more lemonade. That's awesome. And, and because we're out of time, I just wanted to thank you, Steve, for um, sharing your story. I just, I just, since I heard it the first time, just thought it was phenomenal. Just a great example. Like anyone who's on the call today, any entrepreneur who um, you know, gets bogged down and doesn't think that uh, you know, the art of the possible is possible. I mean, you've, you've proven that. And you definitely, as Judy said, made lemonade out of lemons. And you did it really, really fast and extremely efficiently. This is a great, great story. So thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I, uh, I, I hope that each and every one of you out there that uh, has that entrepreneurial spirit has the opportunity to, to start your own business and to go down an avenue that will be successful for you in, in whatever those endeavors might be. So I, I really appreciate will, the opportunity. To hear my and it will almost never end up the way you think it's going to. <laughs> it never does. It never does. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Steve, so much. And just to, to add on to what Simon was saying, uh, thank you so much for your uh, candidness and transparency. It's, it's just amazing for you to be you know, so open and, and willing to share all this with us. Thank you. That was so my much. pleasure. Good. Yeah. It's an interesting story to tell, and I'm happy to share it. No, it's awesome. And, and Simon, thank you so much for connecting the dots for us. Uh, this was invaluable. Uh, very motivational, very inspiring, and, and that's what we need right now. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so quick, quick wrap. Our next Coffee and Conversation is February 10, same time. Uh, Donica Frensich and Rolanda Lochi will be presenting uh, a little bit on um, you know, tips and tricks, how to be best prepared to, uh, to raise money from, um, with angel investors, uh, equity funding type um, uh, fundraising. Uh, you can register on the link that's here. And uh, if you need, uh, if you have any questions, need any additional information, contact us at slowsbdc at gmail.com. Thank you both so much. And we'll, we'll talk again soon, I hope. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Bye, your time. Thanks, Steve. Take yeah. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.